seven biggest mistakes the world will make in the end times. Number one, accepting the beast and his mark. The Old Testament contains 15 books of prophecy, while the New Testament has only one, Revelation. The Apostle John wrote Revelation while he was in Ephesus, where he and Mary, the mother of Jesus, spent the rest of their lives. Revelation was written towards the end of the first century. During that time, Emperor Domitian required everyone to burn incense to Caesar once a year on the Lord's Day. People had to stand before an altar, raise their hands, and declare, Caesar is Lord. For the early Christian communities, this was a significant challenge. Their faith was clear, Jesus is Lord. They could not say Caesar is Lord without facing severe consequences. It was now essential to see if the Christians would stay firm in their faith. People have been dying for their faith even before the creation of this book. The book serves as the guide for those who are willing to die for what they believe. John wrote down what he saw and heard, and sometimes what he saw was so extraordinary that the angel had to remind him 11 times to write it all down. The book of Revelation covers the events that occur before, during, and after the return of the Lord Jesus. What is the mark of the beast? We all have specific numbers that stand out to us. This number could be your favorite athlete or your date of birth. However, a certain number found in Revelation has intrigued many people for many years. And this is the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast appears in Revelation. The mark of the beast is referred to as the mark of the beast because it is brought into being by a man who is referred to as the beast. Revelation is full of graphical language. Through the continued use of symbols, we can visualize what would otherwise be ungraspable. It cannot be too strongly emphasized that this is intended to help our understanding, not hinder it. So many individuals have used the highly symbolic nature of the book of Revelation to neglect or even dismiss its instruction as if the symbols are too vague to convey a clear message. That is entirely not the case. Six seals and six trumpets are over. The very last series of disasters is about to happen. It will be the worst for the world. Evil powers will gain a tighter grip on society than ever before, though their hold is about to be broken. In this section, three individuals come together to form an alliance with the goal of ruling the world. Among them is a being of angelic origin and nature referred to as the Great Dragon and Ancient Serpent, commonly known as Satan or the Devil. The other two are human in origin and nature, beasts, otherwise known as the Antichrist and the False Prophet. Together they form a kind of unholy trinity in a ghastly mimicry of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Revelation 13, 1 through 3 And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten crowns, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been fatally wounded, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. His rise to power will be subtle, initially going unnoticed even by those closest to the action. He will emerge from the common populace. According to John in biblical imagery, the sea represents the general mass of humanity, or more specifically, the Gentile nations. Despite the horrors of the tribulation, it will never be beyond God's control. Satan is restrained by a leash held by God. Satan re-enters the narrative during the Troubles for the first time since the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. As the seals and trumpets unleash their burden on the earth, Satan has been in heaven. The two beasts appear in chapter 13. The primary figure is a political leader, a world dictator who wields totalitarian control over all known ethnic groups. He is the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, who acknowledges no higher law than his own will, claims divinity, and demands worship. The beast is a human individual who accepts the satanic offer that Jesus refused. But he is also anti-Christian in the broader sense of that prefix. He has the power to make war against the saints and to overcome them. His characteristics are those of other fierce beasts, leopard, bear, and lion, human or divine. He seems to arise from a federation of political rulers, 
gaining the world's attention through an astonishing recovery from a fatal wound, presumably in an attempted assassination. His blasphemous egotism is broadcast for 42 months. His position is bolstered by the second beast, a religious colleague with supernatural power who focuses the world's worship on his superior. His miracles will deceive the nations as he commands fire to fall down from the sky and images of the dictator to speak. His appearance will be like a lamb, a young sheep with only two horns. According to the Bible passages in Revelation 16:2 and 19:20, the mark of the beast is a symbol that distinguishes those who worship the beast out of the sea. Revelation 16:2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. And loathsome and malignant sores came on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Revelation shows us the economic strategy of the first beast and the second beast. Revelation 13, 16-17 And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. And he decrees that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark either the name of the beast or the number of his name. He causes all to receive a mark. A mark will be given to everyone under the government of the beast and his associate. This mark is necessary to participate in the economy, and those without it will not be able to buy or sell anything. Only those bearing a special number on a visible part of their body, hand or forehead, will be allowed to trade, and the number will only be marked on those who engage in imperial idolatry. The number 666 is the coded name of the dictator. We have already discussed its meaning, the nature of apocalyptic writing. Until he arrives, when his identity with this figure will be only too obvious, all attempts to decode it are useless speculation. One thing is clear, he will fall short of perfection seven in every regard. The ancient Greek word charagma refers to a mark, which some interpret as a symbolic mark. However, it's not commonly associated with people. Nevertheless, the idea of a physical mark being necessary for buying or selling is not impossible and could be practical. The technology to provide people with a mark enabling them to participate in the electronic economy is available. There are various ways this could be implemented, and such programs are constantly being proposed and tested. The notion of a mark on the right hand or forehead is seen as a satanic imitation of something God will do as Satan is not a creative being and can only imitate God. It is considered an imitation of God's mark upon his people. Revelation 7, 3-4 Saying, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we seal, mark, the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard how many were sealed, a hundred and forty-four thousand, twelve thousand sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. The number of his name. This was a common concept in the ancient world. In Greek, and Hebrew as well, letters were assigned a numerical value such as A equaling 1, B equaling 2, and so forth. The Antichrist is described as a man whose appearance was greater than his brothers. He will be extremely irresistible to the masses due to his charismatic personality, speaking abilities, and outstanding good looks. The Apostle John adds to Daniel's account of the Antichrist's blasphemous activities by stating that everyone alive will be required to worship him. Throughout the final three and a half years of the tribulation, the Antichrist will embody Satan himself. According to 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. The Antichrist, referred to as a beast in Revelation 13.1-8, will transition from being a regional leader to a global tyrant and eventually to a deity. The Number of the Beast Revelation 13, 18, Amplified Bible Here is wisdom. Let the person who has enough insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the imperfect number of a man, and his number is 666. The use of numbers as symbols is quite common. The book of Revelation contains numerous instances of the number 7, which appears in connection with stars, lampstands, lamps, seals, trumpets, and bowls. It is considered the perfect number in the Bible, symbolizing completeness. The number 12 is associated with the tribes of the old people of God, 
and the apostles of the new, while 24 combines them. The number 1,000 is the largest and 66 is the most attention-grabbing. Comprised of sixes, it symbolizes the inability of humans to achieve the completeness represented by the number 7. Here, it serves as a clue to the identity of the last world dictator before Jesus reigns for a thousand years, also known as a millennium in Latin. Is it significant that 666 is the total of all the Roman numerals except one? However, attempting to identify him based on this figure will be fruitless until his physical presence makes it very evident. Using this method, many candidates for Antichrist have been suggested, such as Napoleon, Mussolini, Stalin, and so forth. The term Mark has no special biblical usage apart from its association with the beast. The Greek term chiragma was most commonly used for imprints on documents or coins. Chiragma is well attested to have been an imperial seal of the Roman Empire used on official documents during the 1st and 2nd centuries. In addition to its use in Revelation, the term chiragma appears only once in the New Testament, specifically in Acts 17.29, where it refers to an artistic image. Acts 17.29 Therefore, since we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and thought. The more common term for mark or brand is stigma in its noun and verb forms. What is the identity of the Antichrist? How will we be able to identify him? During the tribulation, one man, the Antichrist, will come up to unite the world under one authority, according to the Bible. Like his father, the devil, this worldwide tyrant will disguise himself as an angel of light, but will eventually act in accordance with his true evil nature. Here are six answers to questions about this future sign of the apocalypse. Who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is someone who opposes Christ. Anti can also mean instead of, and both meanings apply to this coming world leader. At the same time, he will openly oppose Christ while posing as Christ. The Antichrist will do all in his power to live up to his dreadful moniker. As Satan leads the world's forces into the Battle of Armageddon, he will persecute, torture, and kill God's people. He will be the most powerful tyrant the world has ever known, dwarfing the likes of Caesar and Hitler. When he comes on the scene, people will flock to him like flies to honey, and they will do anything he asks. How will he unite the nations? The prophet Daniel describes the Antichrist in these terms. Daniel 7, 7-8 After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the great root. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. As Daniel predicts, the next world leader will be known for his or her eloquence, which will attract the world's attention and administration. Daniel goes on to tell us that not only will this golden-tongued orator speak in high-blown terms, but he will also speak arrogantly against God. The Apostle John describes him similarly in the book of Revelation. The beast was given a mouth to speak arrogant and blasphemous words and authority to act for 42 months. Revelation 13.5 A mouth was given to him speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Who will worship the Antichrist? According to Revelation 13.8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Based on Daniel 7.25, the Antichrist is depicted as a cult leader. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. He will speak out against the true God of heaven. The language used suggests that he will try to elevate himself to the level of God and make declarations from that position. According to 2 Thessalonians 2.4, the Antichrist opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He will seek to receive worship from the people of the world. 
Does the Mark of the Beast Exist Today? The Mark of the Beast mentioned in Revelation 13 has led many to wonder whether it will be a high-tech tattoo or part of a billionaire's plan. However, the Bible is clear about what the mark is and when it will appear. Firstly, there is a specific timing requirement for the mark. The scriptures indicate that the mark of the beast will only appear at a particular time and place in history, and as of now, we have not reached that time or place. The reason it is called the mark of the beast is because it is associated with a man referred to as the beast. This means that the mark will be brought into existence by this individual. Therefore, until the Antichrist is ruling the entire earth, there can be no mark. According to the Bible, the beast and his mark will not appear on earth until the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. As a result, the mark cannot exist in any form prior to the tribulation. Therefore, any suggestion that a mark of the beast exists today in any form is merely a forewarning. Number 2. Eliminating the Two Witnesses the Two Witnesses A description of two people who will assist in carrying out the work that God has for them to do during the time of the tribulation can be found in Revelation 11, 3-12. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for twelve hundred and sixty days, forty-two months, three and one-half years, dressed in sackcloth. These witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands which stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. Revelation 11, 3-5 At the end, there will be two witnesses who will prophesy in the city of Jerusalem. There is a sense of impending disaster in the spectacular appearance of these two mighty. Between the sixth and seven trumpets, attention is focused on the human channels through which the divine revelations are communicated. The key word in both chapters is prophecy. Revelation 10.11 Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. The verse reads, My Two Witnesses. This introduces two more interesting characters of Revelation, the two witnesses. The nature of their ministry is prophetic, as evidenced by the fact that they will prophesy. They preach and display repentance as seen by their wearing sackcloth and they have an effective ministry as we read, I will give power. The two witnesses indeed served with power, such power in fact that they can witness for 1260 days despite the world's antagonism. We also read, and if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. God has given the two witnesses special protection similar to Elijah. All of the nouns used to refer to the two witnesses in this passage are masculine in ancient Greek grammar. The two witnesses are two men. The two witnesses in the book of Revelation will have miraculous powers to accompany their message, and no one will be able to stop them in their work. Revelation 11.6 These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have the power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. The two witnesses will have miraculous power, but they will be killed when their testimony is concluded. The wicked world will rejoice, allowing the bodies of the fallen prophets to lie in the streets. Revelation 11, 7-10 When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make a war with them and will overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies will lie on the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For from the peoples, tribes, languages, and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days, and will not allow their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who live on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who lived on the earth and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. The term as Sodom speaks of immorality, and the term as Egypt speaks of oppression and slavery. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another. The earth saw and triumphed over the deaths of these two witnesses.
It is possible that the fact that people see this of all peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations is an indirect foreshadowing of how current mass media works. It is incredible and not far-fetched at all to think of a live worldwide broadcast on new channels and over the internet and see the fantastic scene described here. The preaching of these two witnesses and their call to repentance was a torment for many because they could not stand to hear the truth while they loved their lie. Their bodies will lie in the streets for just over three days, while the transnational mass, tormented in conscience by their expressions, gloat over and celebrate the removal. When the two are resurrected in full view of everyone, the relief will turn to terror. Their ascension will be triggered by a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. The Reviving of the Two Witnesses Revelation 11, 11 through 12 And after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. Because the earth was unworthy of these two witnesses, God simply summoned them, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. We read the phrase, come up here. The earth was not worthy of these two witnesses, so God simply called them home, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. It is clear that the masses always fail to listen to the prophets of God. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake. An earthquake brings judgment and inspires many to praise God. However, it remains to be seen whether this will result in genuine repentance leading to salvation. When the people leave the city, a strong earthquake will have already destroyed one-tenth of the buildings there and slain 7,000 of the city's inhabitants. It is impossible to ignore the startling similarities between the deaths of these two witnesses and that of Jesus. It will be impossible to avoid thinking about the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ that took place. Number 3. Cursing God After the Judgments After the judgments on the world, the world curses God. The first four of the seven seals open, releasing what are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, because the judgments appear metaphorically as a horse and rider, leaving destruction in their path. The fifth seal. The fifth seal of the scroll indicates those who would be martyred throughout the tribulation for their trust in Christ. The sixth seal. When the Lamb of God breaks the sixth seal, a great earthquake strikes, inflicting massive destruction and extraordinary astronomical phenomena. The sun goes black, the moon changes blood red, and the heavens recede like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was displaced from its place. The Seventh Seal The judgments that led up to the end of the tribulation are now evident in the scroll, and they are so harsh that all of heaven falls silent. The seventh seal clearly heralds the start of the next round of judgments, as John instantly sees seven angels holding seven trumpets ready to blow. An eighth angel takes a censer and burns much incense in it, indicating God's people's petitions. When the seven seal judgments are completed, the second phase of the tribulation, which includes the seven trumpet judgments, will begin. In Revelation 8 through 9, John describes a time near the end of the world when angels sound seven trumpets. Each trumpet heralds the arrival of a new round of judgment on the people of the earth. The seven trumpets are described in Revelation chapters 8 and 9, as well as in Revelation 11, 15 through 19. The trumpets represent disasters. During the chaos, it's natural to wonder how humanity reacted. Ideally, one would hope for repentance or an acknowledgement of the divine hand at work. However, even as massive hailstones fell from the sky, the human spirit remained stubborn. Instead of seeking forgiveness or understanding, the people cursed God. Revelation 16.21, New American Standard Bible And huge hailstones, weighing about a talent each, came down from heaven upon people, and people blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because the hailstone plague was extremely severe. Their hearts were hardened by years of rebellion, couldn't grasp the magnitude of their error. Thus, the seventh bowl wasn't merely a demonstration of God's power, but a clear indication of human frailty and the consequences of persistent defiance. The story serves as a somber reminder that while God is patient and merciful, 
there comes a time when justice must prevail. The book of Revelation talks about the world's ending and God's final plan. With each bowl poured out, the urgency and gravity of God's judgment becomes clearer. The purpose of the described events is not to cause fear, but rather to emphasize the significant consequences of a society that rejects its creator. The story features God's wrath. The judgments serve as a profound testament to God's righteous indignation against the wickedness and rebellion of humanity. As each bowl is poured out, the earth experiences unprecedented calamities, from painful sores afflicting people Revelation 16, 2, to the sun scorching the earth with intense heat Revelation 16, 8. It's crucial to understand why these events are significant. According to the Bible, they're like puzzle pieces that fit into a larger picture. These occurrences are part of God's grand plan, which serves as a reminder that God is in control of everything. Falling for the False Prophet Satan often tries to imitate or copy the things of God to make himself seem like God. This is a common strategy of his. In Revelation 12 and 13, there is a description of the so-called unholy trinity, which is an example of this. The Holy Trinity consists of God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. The unholy trinity, on the other hand, consists of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. These are counterfeit versions of the Holy Trinity. Satan is the first person and father of the unholy trinity. The Antichrist is the second member and son. The false prophet, as the third member, directs people's worship and praise to the Antichrist. The Holy Trinity is characterized by infinite truth, love, and goodness, while the unholy trinity exhibits characteristics that are the opposite, deception, hatred, and pure evil. Revelation 12 and 13 contain prophecy passages that describe some of the major events and characters involved in the second half of the seven-year tribulation period. Although many Bible passages refer to Satan in various forms, such as a serpent or an angel of light, he is described as a great red dragon. In Revelation 12:3, his vicious and homicidal personality is represented by the color red. Many important facts about Satan are revealed in Revelation 12. During a rebellion before the world began, Satan and one-third of the angels were cast out of heaven. The archangel Michael and the other angels will wage war against Satan and his demons, and Satan will be permanently barred from heaven. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, the beast or Antichrist as described in Revelation 13 and Daniel 7, is the second member of the unholy trinity. The Antichrist is someone who opposes Christ. The prefix anti can also mean instead of, and both meanings will apply to the world leader. He will openly oppose Christ while also passing himself off as Christ. The false prophet is Revelation 13, 11 through 18. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who live on it worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of the sky to the earth in the presence of people. And he deceives those who live on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who live on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause all who do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. And he decrees that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. The second beast emerges from the earth rather than the sea. Although he appears meek, mild, and benevolent, the horns indicate that he will wield power. Jesus specifically warned believers to be on the lookout for false prophets who may appear innocent but can be extremely destructive. Matthew 7.15 Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves.
The false prophet is capable of performing great signs and wonders, such as bringing fire down from heaven, Revelation 13, 13. He raises an image of the Antichrist for worship, gives the image life, demands that all people worship the image, and executes those who refuse to worship the image. According to Revelation 20, verse 4, the method of execution will be beheading. The false prophet will also force everyone to get a permanent mark of some kind, just like slaves did in John's day, to demonstrate total devotion to the Antichrist and the renunciation of God. Only those who have received the mark will be allowed to conduct business. Accepting the mark results in eternal death, Revelation 14.10. The Bible makes it clear that humans will fully comprehend that by accepting the mark, they are accepting not only an economic system, but also a worship system that rejects Jesus Christ. The number of the beast is revealed in Revelation 13.18, 666. Satan is the anti-God, the beast is the anti-Christ, and the false prophet is the anti-spirit. This unholy trinity will persecute believers and deceive many others, causing them to perish eternally. However, God's kingdom will triumph. Daniel 7, 21-22 states, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Number 5. Worshipping the Religion of Babylon An angel invites John to witness the judgment of this strange woman. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came and spoke to me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgments and doom of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters influencing nations. She with whom the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality, and the inhabitants of the earth have become intoxicated with the wine of her immorality. Revelation 17, 1-2 We read, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute. Right from the start, her judgment is unquestionable. There is never any doubt regarding the fate and ultimate failure of Babylon. Babylon came into being as a religious system a considerable time before Christianity did. But in satanic imitation, it anticipated the coming of the genuine Messiah. According to religious history and legend, the Babylonian religion was founded by Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, a great-grandson of Noah. She was a high priestess of idol worship. We read, Who sits on many waters. Here, Babylon rests on many waters which translates to the fact that she rules over many different nations. Her personality is one that can be understood on a global scale. She is an international character. Babylonian religion intoxicates people and kings. Karl Marx argued that religion is the opiate of the masses. He was partially correct in his assessment, because empty religion is the opium of the masses. We read, Made drunk with the wine of her fornication, Throughout the entirety of the Bible, the concept of fornication is frequently and strongly associated with acts of idolatry. It is possible that this religious system will appear to be appealing and spiritual, though not necessarily moral. The Idea Around Babylon In the Bible, the city of Babylon is mentioned a total of 287 times, making it the city that is mentioned the most after Jerusalem. On the banks of the Euphrates River once stood the city of Babylon. In the immediate aftermath of the flood, Genesis 11, 1-10, reveals that Babylon was the seat of the civilization that expressed organized hostility to God. Later on, Babylon became the capital of the empire that mercilessly conquered Judah. During that time, Judah was under its control. Babylon, to the people of God, was the essence of all evil. It was the embodiment of cruelty, lust, and greed. It was the enemy of the people of God. Those who are familiar with the Old Testament will be aware that the word Babylon is linked to organized forms of worship and blasphemy, as well as the oppression of the people of God. In John's day, Rome embodied all the resistance and antagonism to the Christian belief. The notion of Babylon predates both Revelation 17 and 18, as well as the reign of the Antichrist. Babylon as the world system has always been around, from the time of John, when Rome exemplified it, to the current day and throughout history. 
However, during the reign of the Antichrist, Babylon, in both its religious and commercial guises, will exert an influence over the world that has never been seen before. The religious Babylon is described, Revelation 7, 3-6, Amplified Bible. And the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was entirely covered with blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold, precious stones and pearls, and she was holding in her hand a gold cup full of the abominations and the filth of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, false religions, heresies, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, God's people, and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus who were martyred. When I saw her, I wondered in amazement. We read, He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. John is taken away into the wilderness. The barren nature of the wilderness makes for a fitting backdrop for a vision of judgment. We read, Sitting on a scarlet beast. This beast, which has been depicted in Revelation 13.1 as having seven heads and ten horns, is symbolic of the Antichrist and the rule that he will establish. The harlot rides the same beast that is mentioned in that verse. Revelation 13.1, Amplified Bible. And the dragon, Satan, stood on the sandy shore of the sea. Then I saw a vicious beast coming up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten royal crowns, diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. We read, Mystery, Babylon the Great. This title does not refer to the physical city of Babylon, but rather to the spiritual secret representation of Babylon, which is the origin of all forms of spiritual adultery and idolatry. This harlot must encompass more territory than a single department of a religious organization. She is the personification of Satan's very own movement, which might be described as the religion of the global order. Our world is ready to be seduced by this harlot because it is built on the strong notion that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. We read, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. The woman not only persecutes, but she also takes pleasure in the fact that she is persecuting the godly, much like a drunk person takes pleasure in alcohol. It is imperative that we do not lose sight of the fact that some of the most heinous atrocities committed against genuine Christians have been committed in the name of the church. Between the years 1555 and 1558, under the reign of Queen Mary, also known as Bloody Mary, England saw the execution of around 288 Christians who took a stand for the truth of the Christian religion by having them burned at the stake. Why was this symbol depicted as a female form? A great number of nations have given their homelands the form of a female figure. The prophets frequently portrayed the people of God as either his faithful wife when they were pure or as a prostitute when they were unfaithful. Speakers frequently expand their points by contrasting figures. For example, we see Jerusalem portrayed as a woman in Isaiah 62, 5. For as a young man marries a virgin, O Jerusalem, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. And we see a contrasting figure in Ezekiel 16.20. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters, whom you had borne to me, and you destroyed them as sacrifices to your man-made gods. Were your gross immoralities so small a matter? In two Old Testament instances we see this. Nineveh, the capital of the evil Assyrian Empire, seduced the nations with her prostitution and witchcraft. We also see this in the economic power Tyre, acting as a prostitute with all peoples. John is informed by the angel that all will be made clear to him regarding the harlot. Revelation 17.7, Amplified Bible. But the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her which has the seven heads and ten horns. We read, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. The focus of the exposition is on the beast. It seemed as though this lady governed, rode the system that the Antichrist had created, but in reality, he is the driving force behind everything and is simply using her in the same way that tyrants have always used religion as a means to achieve their goals. 
Revelation 17.9, Amplified Bible. The beast that you saw was once, but now is not, and he is about to come up out of the abyss, the bottomless pit, the dwelling place of demons, and go to destruction, perdition. And the inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because he was and is not and is yet to come to earth. Here is the mind which has wisdom, and this is what it knows about the vision. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. We read, the seven heads are seven mountains. The city of Rome is commonly referred to as the city on seven hills, and as a result, many people instantly connect the seven mountains with Rome. Mountains can symbolically represent nations or governments in the Bible, as seen, for example, in Daniel 2.35. Revelation 17.10, Amplified Bible. And they are seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One exists and is reigning, the other, the seventh, has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain a little while. This seventh will very rapidly be usurped by an eighth, who will become the state of the Antichrist. Revelation 1711, Amplified Bible. And the beast that once but is not, is himself also an eighth king, and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction, perdition. The beast, also known as the Antichrist, can be identified without a doubt as the eighth king, in the sense that he has qualities with all of the prior world empires, he is one of the seven, but his demise is already predetermined. The word perdition literally translates to destruction, and that is exactly what will happen to the beast. Number 6. Staying in Babylon After the strange woman falls, Babylon follows suit. Revelation 18, 4-5, Amplified Bible And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not be a partner in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins, crimes, transgressions have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her wickedness and crimes for judgment. Why Babylon's Matter to Us Babylon's story teaches us that being too proud can get us into trouble, and it's important to be humble. It teaches us that however mighty or ambitious we may be, our plans must align with God's will. When they don't, the results can be undesirable. The story of Babylon is that of caution. It warns us against the dangers of pride and self-reliance, urging us to depend on God instead. It also speaks to the folly of human effort to achieve unity or immorality outside of God's plan. Whether as a community or as individuals, the story reminds us that our ambitions should be aligned with God's will. Otherwise, like the people of Babylon, we risk finding ourselves working against God's purposes, and that can only lead to confusion and ultimately to our downfall. So, the next time you find yourself striving to build a tower, take a moment to consider whether your ambitions align with God's plan for you. Remember, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders label in vain. Psalm 127, 1. Prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah foretold Babylon's fall due to its injustices, idolatry, and immorality. Therefore, as individuals or as a society, our actions have consequences. Oppressing others, disregarding morality, and turning away from what's right can lead to downfall. We also see that earthly kingdoms are temporary. Despite its might and grandeur, Babylon eventually fell to the Medo Persian Empire just as it was foretold. In other words, everything on earth is temporary, from our own successes to the way society is built. The only thing that will last forever is God's kingdom. So focus on what will last forever, not just on what is here today and gone tomorrow. The story of Babylon getting powerful and then falling apart shows us that God tries to communicate with us in many ways, and we should pay attention and not be too proud. Babylon was an amazing place made by people but it fell apart because God wanted it to. This story is always important because it reminds us that the real power and greatness belong to God. Like it says in the Bible, God's rule is forever and it will always be there for all generations. Daniel 4.34 Revelation 18, 6-8 Repay to her even as she has repaid others, and pay back to her double her torment in accordance with what she has done, in the cup of sin and suffering, which she mixed, mix a double portion of perfect justice for her. 
to the degree that she glorified herself and reveled and gloated in her sensuality, living deliciously and luxuriously, to that same degree impose on her torment and anguish and mourning and grief, for in her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen on a throne, and I am not a widow, and I will never ever see mourning or experience grief. For this reason, in a single day her plagues, afflictions, calamities will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire and completely consumed. For strong and powerful is the Lord God who judges her. Going to War with Christ This meeting of the Antichrist and Jesus occurs in Revelation 16. In this chapter, we have an account of the pouring forth of these vials that were filled with the wrath of God. They were released against the entirety of the Antichristian Empire, along with everything that was associated with it. This judgment is poured upon the earth, upon the sea, upon the rivers and fountains of water. The seven terrible plagues are poured out on the earth. In spite of the devastating effects of the plagues, people will continue to speak ill of God rather than praise Him. God's terrifying wrath purges the earth of evil. Both the sixth bowl and the sixth trumpet have something to do with the Euphrates River. Both judgments focus on militaries that have been motivated by demonic activity. The meeting begins with the drying of the Euphrates River. Revelation 16.12, Amplified Bible. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way would be prepared for the coming of the kings from the east. And observe where it fell, upon the great river Euphrates. Some take it literally as the place where the Turkish power and empire began. During ancient times, the Romans believed that the Euphrates River acted as a secure barrier against potential invasions originating from the empires of the east. At that point in history, the river stretched for approximately 1,800 miles, 2,900 kilometers, and its width ranged from 300 to 1,200 yards, 275 to 1,100 meters. However, if the Euphrates River was to be dried up and converted into a road, it would allow massive armies from the east, including nations such as China, India, and Japan, to move westward with ease. In the end, they will fight against God and His Messiah. As God executes the Sixth Bowl Judgment, He guides history towards Armageddon's battle. What was the result of this vial? It caused the river to dry up, depriving the city of its sources of wealth, provisions, and other necessities. They are spirits of demons performing signs. Again, signs and wonders are used by demons as tools of deception. Revelation 13 refers to this particular false prophet as the second beast. We read, Gather them to the battle. That this battle is not one nation fighting another nation, but rather God fighting against the nations of the world. The prophecy speaks of three significant conflicts, and this is one of them. The great dragon is making a final attempt to regain his power and status in the world. He is gathering his forces and summoning his spirits to launch one last desperate attack before it's too late. Here observe the instruments he makes use of to engage the powers of the earth in his cause and quarrel. Three unclean spirits. The three unclean spirits refer to the demons who assist Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. Through performing miracles, they will persuade the eastern kings, as well as the armies of rulers from around the world, to assemble and engage in battle against the second coming of Christ. We read, That great day of God Almighty. It is clear who will emerge victorious from this battle. It is the great day of God, not of man, the Antichrist or the dragon. Amidst the portrayal of the impending battle, there is a call to action to be prepared for the triumph of Jesus. We read Armageddon. Armageddon, also known as Har Megiddo, is the site of a significant battle. This day marked the beginning of the end of the Antichrist rule. On that fateful day, the world will witness a sky show with signs and wonders filling the sky. The heavens seem to open and light pierce through the darkness. As described in Matthew 24, 27, For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Ultimately, the Antichrist comes to seek battle with Jesus. Psalm 2, New American Standard Bible. Why are the nations restless and the peoples plotting in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together 
against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let's tear their shackles apart and throw their ropes away from us. After the meeting of Jesus and the Antichrist The Bible teaches that the Antichrist's reign will come to an end at the return of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation, which is a prophetic vision given to the Apostle John, provides the most vivid description. Judgment The concept of judgment is a common theme in the Bible. It's about being responsible for our actions, the chance to be saved or forgiven, and fairness. This theme combines how we behave with how God watches over everything. The Bible portrays the final judgment as a decisive moment when God evaluates every person's actions and intentions. This judgment is depicted in various books, but mainly in the book of Revelation. Revelation 20, 12-13 says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. This passage suggests that everyone, regardless of their status in life, will face judgment. The Bible emphasizes the importance of personal accountability. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Galatians 6, 7. Gracious and loving God, as we come before you today, we seek your guidance and wisdom as we delve into the pages of your holy word, the Bible. We acknowledge that understanding your word is not always easy, but with your help, we know that all things are possible. Lord, we ask for clarity and insight as we study the scriptures. Help us to approach your word with open hearts and minds, ready to receive the truth you have laid out for us. Grant us the discernment to grasp the deeper meanings behind the stories and teachings presented to us. We pray for humility, recognizing that we are but finite beings seeking to comprehend the infinite wisdom of your word. Help us to set aside our preconceived notions and biases, allowing your truth to penetrate our hearts and transform our lives. May your Holy Spirit be our guide as we navigate the complexities of Scripture. Illuminate the passages that seem obscure or difficult to understand, revealing to us the profound truths hidden within. Give us the patience to wrestle with difficult concepts and the perseverance to seek answers diligently. Lord, we ask for unity among your people as we study your word together. Help us to approach discussions with love and respect for one another, recognizing that we all have much to learn from each other. Grant us the grace to extend kindness and understanding to those who may interpret your word differently than we do. As we gain knowledge and understanding of your word, may it not simply be for our own edification, but for the building up of your kingdom here on earth. Empower us to live out the teachings of Scripture in our daily lives becoming beacons of your love and grace to those around us. We lift up to you those who have not yet come to know you through your word. Open their hearts and minds to receive the message of salvation found within its pages. Use us as instruments of your peace and reconciliation, sharing the good news of your love with boldness and humility. Finally, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through its pages and for giving us a roadmap for navigating this life. May we always treasure and cherish the scriptures, allowing them to shape us into the people you have called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 